Okay. Um, welcome at uh, Career Currents. Um, Career Currents, the third Career Currents we're doing, uh, Career Currents 2021. Uh, good that you're here. Um, and um, it's a special Career Currents uh, because we, uh, this year we made with a group of 22 queer organizations, we made an alliance. It's called Visibility and Pride. And uh, uh, it was a huge process. Um, we were sort of pushed by the city of Amsterdam to do this, but uh, it, it was a very special process. And uh, um, we learned a lot, I think everybody learned a lot, and we, for two years we're going to work together as an alliance. And also the, we made a TUC, which is based on actually the first, the last mile first, and, uh, uh, which is very important I think nowadays to do. And I think and I hope that the whole, this idea of the last mile first is for the whole program this year, 15 days of preference. I think we have around 50 um, events and uh, um, so there's a lot to see, so do come. Um, today we start with Lene Denise. I'm very, very happy that you're here um, for the first time on talk. Yeah, last year we had an amazing talk by you. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I remember from last year that everybody at the end, everybody was like, oh no, don't stop, mm. go on, because this is so interesting and the way how you bring it. And um, so it's, uh, I'm really looking forward to what you're going to do today. Mm. And uh, even their fans in the audience, so that's, that's, uh, that's yeah. the rupees here. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start. And uh, I give the floor to you. Thank Great to be here. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks. And, uh, thank and everybody enjoy the Career Currents 2021. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, this doesn't amplify it, it just records it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So I don't need yeah, that then. Yeah, but you all can hear me? Yep. Oh, there's an echo. Um, I like the acoustics here, and it's so good in here, and I am grateful to be here. Um, I'm grateful that all of you that are here made it through one of the most intense times that we know as human beings. Um, I was here with you in Amsterdam from September to April. Lockdown, snow, snow fights, snow sleds, frozen canals, you know, curfew, right? And it was interesting um, to, to be part of a place where I don't speak the language and all I had was the human experience of what we were all dealing with, right? What it, what it felt like to be isolated, alienated, you know, concerned about safety and all of those things. So um, Amsterdam has a special place in my heart for that reason, but also because I am married to someone who was born and raised here, someone who is Dutch and South African and Indian, um, and someone who is a major part of my practice and kind of um, my 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 what do you my thinking partner across issues that affect global communities, right? So I just want to say thank you to Queer Currents. It's one of my favorite organizations, and to Heist, which is a name that I don't want to say because it makes me feel like I'm not from here. <laughs> but it's a beautiful, powerful name. Like. It's like it makes you be still when you say it to make sure you say it correctly. And I think that that's how I would describe you, actually. You, you want to say your name well, and you're doing incredible work here, so thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. And I love that we're aligned because we actually haven't spoken. And that means you trust me, <laughs> you know? Like, but what's amazing about what you just said is this question of solidarity, which is at the core of what I want to talk about today. Solidarity and visibility. Right and the and the how those are two very simple but super complex words and concepts and challenges. What do we mean by visibility? And what do we mean by solidarity when we're not starting from an equal right level? Right. So what does solidarity look like if I am in the room with people who have more privileges than I do? How can I be and how can you be? in solidarity with me, right? That's a real question to start with, right? Is that let us not take the language of solidarity lightly. Let us really think critically about what it takes and how incredibly uncomfortable it is. 
to be in solidarity with people who don't look like you, who don't speak like you, who don't smell like you, right? What does it mean to be slightly uncomfortable so that you can be in solidarity? So I think that the thing that I want to anchor my presentation in is the notion of representation, right? And media and popular culture. Um, because the politics of solidarity are actually informed by what we know. That's, that's the very basic thing to say. The, 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 the politics of solidarity are based on what we know. And so we come into these spaces and we try to communicate and then we discover what we don't know, right? And we offend people or we connect with people and it's a spectrum of reactions that we are vulnerable to experiencing. It does come down to a phrase that I like to use a lot. I was using it a lot when Donald Trump was the president of that place over there. Now, I am still using it because it comes back to me in the context of queerness, which is intellectual curiosity. I mean, it seems simple, <laughs> again, just like solidarity, just like visibility, but intellectual curiosity, you know what that means? Are you going to be in solidarity with me enough to be curious about who I am and what my history is and perhaps what your role is in my history and my future? Or do you want the kind of solidarity that's just like, hey, we're in the same room, so it's diverse? What, what kind of, so, what does your solidarity look like? Your solidarity is going to be informed by what you are asking questions about. Right? And what we ask questions about reveal where and who we are, but also what we've learned up until that point. Right? So I want to be vulnerable and talk about um, later on, you know, what it means to unlearn and unsee. And how that in itself is a process. Unlearning and unseeing. So when I talk about being seen, I am thinking about media representation, representation in the arts, right? And how that then informs the kind of solidarity that we can have with other people, right? So I think right now, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, actually I'm sure right now that like I think it's stated um, that there is an exhibition on slavery, right? That there have been these conversations that have been pushing Dutch folks to reconsider how they think about race. And now museums are involved, right? And now different kind of organizations and institutions that have been responsible for educating you, right, is now involved with having these uncomfortable conversations, right? So that means social progress, good. We're, we're, in, a, we're in a good starting place. Now we have to ask questions about the media. How many of you grew up and I actually want to ask this question and I want you all to raise your hands. Please raise your hands if you grew up seeing black, gay, Dutch people on television on a regular basis. Like, that's a beautiful, th that's. Sesame Street is one of my. Did you say Sesame Street? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, you're right. But like also in the news, or I think in the Netherlands, there, there have been. Still underrepresented, but yes. But you said that's so interesting that you went to Sesame Street. So American television. Mm -hmm. So let me reframe my question. Oh, the Dutch version. Yeah. Oh, it's a Dutch version of Sesame Street? What channel is it? No, I don't know. But <laughs> what? There's a Dutch version of Sesame Street? Or are you saying yeah, it's translated? No, no, there's a Dutch version. So there's. But that's yeah. important to know. Yeah, so there's, there, 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 when I was a child, there were Dutch uh, actors and some of them uh, uh, representing groups of minorities. And there were black queer folks on Sesame Street. Queer? I'm not sure. Oh, no. Okay, so let me rephrase because I'm very specifically yeah. talking about black queerness in a Dutch context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I was going to say, if Sesame Street was dealing with black queerness, like, that's <laughs> 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 like, wow. No, very specifically. Black queerness. Mm -hmm.
in the Dutch context. Did you all show of hands for anyone who have, has who has had access to black queerness in a Dutch context based on what you have watched on Dutch television for the last, I'm just gonna say 50 years to make room for everyone who's in the room. 50 years. <laughs> if the answer is no, then we have a beginning place. How then, the question becomes, have you learned about black queerness? And the uncomfortable question is, and why have you not been curious? Well, Detroit and Chicago. Well, no, you no, don't count. <laughs> you have and you answer. Yeah. No, but that is, a, yeah. oh, matter of fact, thank you. Beyond music. Okay. Beyond music, right? Because it's easy to love what black people do musically. I mean, we're undeniable. Yeah. We're great people. It may, it may be cheesy, but Marvin Gaye, who was not gay, but he was also homophobic almost. So well, we don't know that what he was. That's what we, we look you know. That's what he said. Listen, uh, that's a deep question. And Donna Summer is also, you could say. Well, it's yeah. a deep question whether or not these yeah. people were gay or not. Or uh, they, they attracted gay audiences. That's how we Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Diana Especially Donna Boston. Summer, of course. Absolutely. Donna Summer, Disco, Marvin, yeah. Gay. It's funny that you say that. It's going to take me on a tangent. I'm going to say this quickly, though. You talk about him being homophobic. His father, right, is a someone who identified as a cross-dresser who was also a minister, right? And so Marvin Gay grew up with the last name Gay, and so he adds the E to it in order to be, a, you know, like... Yeah, to make sure... To make sure that you don't see his name and associate him with yeah. gayness. Yet, there is something very queer about how he approaches music. This is a whole other situation. We can have that conversation. It's totally different, but... James Baldwin. Yeah, James Baldwin, absolutely. And both Marvin Gaye and James Baldwin being people who, like me, came to Europe to be surrounded by a language that you don't speak and understand and to be dealing with questions of race, almost alone, because you don't speak the language, right? That's what's happening for me every day in, in the Netherlands. I've been here coming back and forth over the last five years. I digress, let me move on. To be seen is to be alive. We've gathered, we've arrived at the point where we know we haven't really asked questions or demanded that we see a diverse representation of queerness in the Netherlands, right? Because we can agree with that, that it hasn't occurred to us to be like, wait a minute, we are sharing this country, we should know who the people are that we are neighbors with. Right, like, and, and then, so I just want to start with the, the, the powerful kind of, or the provocative statement of to be seen is to be alive. I mean, that's a provocative statement because it implies that if you are not seen, then you are dead. Doesn't it imply that, right? That if you're not seen, you are dead. So what I want to do is ask why it matters. And the word matter has become a global mobilizing <laughs> right word. Everybody is talking about what matters now, right? Of course, black life, but in general, gay lives matter, you know, children matter, literature matters, albums matter. Like I, I've seen variations of what matters since the Black Lives Matter movement launched the phrase into the global public consciousness, right? But why does it matter to be represented? And then I said before that when you are not represented, when you are not a part of the national consciousness as a person who is living, then are you more vulnerable to different forms of violence? Are you more vulnerable to premature death? But the different thing, and I know that that's a dark, this is a heavy conversation, I know, but it's, I'm trying to have it in a light way because really we're just like human beings at a critical time where it's important that we sit down face to face and have this conversation like so i mean it in a way that's just like think about what it means to live in a place for generations and not see yourself represented on television and television people prefer to watch television than they do to read right then so i'm not even going to ask you the question of how many of you have read about the history of black Dutch queerness or black queerness in general? Um, because where are you getting the inspiration to, to consider that to be something that is important? If not 
in your immediate day-to-day -day experiences with your country's um, understanding of media and representation. If there's an invisibility there, then why would you be like, hey, I'm gonna read about James Baldwin, I'm gonna read Gloria Becker's work on white innocence, and I'm gonna read about Dutch racism, right? And all of those scholars that are here doing that work and have been doing that work for a long time. But why would you be interested in it? What has your country told you about the importance of these ideas, these people? And if the answer is nothing, then there again, we have a second starting point. No television, possibly limited engagement of the literature that explains the experiences of black gay people, right? Like, so really a real major distance between white gayness and black gayness and queerness, right? There's a distance. The distance matters because now there are groups here in Amsterdam that are organizing to have a separate black pride, right? We can go to the next one. Those groups, black queer and trans resistance Netherlands, right? Black pride Netherlands. And there was an interesting response. First of all, there's so many cities that already have black pride. The question is what, why has it taken this long? But also, why was there pushback from white gay folks who said, no, that's not solidarity, that's separation? Why? Why, when white gay folks weren't considering the absence of blackness in gay pride, why are they now saying, no, you're trying to separate yourself? When it wasn't a priority or an urgency to have them be represented. Do you know what I mean? Like imagine, one of the most exciting things I've experienced in my entire life is Amsterdam on August 2nd. The canals, the, the flamboyant, gay, sexy, faggy, queeny shit that I am. But also mainly white. And I'm like, I, what would it look like to even have like, just a balance of black folks and white folks, brown folks, Indonesian, Moroccan, Turkish, whoever is here, balance on those canals, because the canals tell the stories, right, of this country's history. And so the fact that when I've gone the last three years, the majority of the people that I see are white speaks to why folks are organizing here to have a separate process, a separate holiday, a separate experience, because they weren't included. It wasn't a priority, right? So that's why representation matters. And so I am talking about diasporic solidarity, and what I mean by that is just like me being conscious of who is already here and who is already doing this work. I'm not bringing this to you all as a black American. I'm just telling you what I've observed, right? It's very important because you know why? Black Americans are always seen globally. Globally. You guys probably grew up seeing more black Americans than you did black Dutch folks, right? Is it, I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second, right? So that's not my problem per se. I don't necessarily feel underrepresented globally. Wherever I've been, South Africa, London, Spain, wherever I've been, there is a high, high chance that folks have seen representations of me. Isn't that interesting, right, to consider? Globally, black Dutch folks have not been seen. I cannot, t I have never in my 46 years, yes, I look very good for my age, you don't have to tell me, no, no, I'm kidding. But 46 years, I don't think that I can name one single person from the Netherlands that has come across my American experience. That's, right? So I wanted to give a shout out to Surinamese homosexuals, Flamboyant, Zami, Sister Outsider, and Strange Fruit, because in the 80s and the 90s, these folks were organizing and talking about the question of solidarity and visibility. And they weren't just black, right? We're talking about migrant work, we're talking about folks from wherever the Dutch have been coming together to have a conversation about how to have visibility, representation, political power, protection, and respect and human rights, right? Um, and so the 80s are just a place of interest for me because I was born in the 70s, so I consider myself to be an 80s baby. I came of age in the 80s. 
So think about what was happening during this time in the 80s and even in Amsterdam, which is what? AIDS. Now, AIDS didn't discriminate. AIDS made it to Amsterdam. AIDS made it to South Africa. AIDS made it to Brazil. AIDS made it to, right, Detroit. AIDS did not discriminate. It snatched up the lives of queer people, all people, but queer people in particular, globally. Right, so folks were organizing around um, issues related to who was dying, issues related to, like I said, representation. Um, and now, when I talk about the black queer and trans resistance and black pride, these are younger folks. I'm thinking of Naomi, I can't remember the last name, Petir. Peter. Peter, right, and Julian. Right? Like, there are folks here that the Black Archives, like, they're doing some of this work, they're asking some of these difficult questions. Right? So I just wanted to just at least acknowledge that, and we can go on. And so um, I talk about my, my partner is Dr. Chandra Frank, and she um, is a considers herself to be a feminist of transnational study, meaning that she looks at the feminist organizations that were mobilizing folks in South Africa, in the Netherlands, and in America, and she looks at those relationships, right? So she went into the archives in Austria, is that an archive, yeah? And she found all these, all this evidence, that's, what, that's the word, evidence of how long black queer folks have existed here. And that's what the archives are, right? Evidence that folks were there. So she found these, um, Archives, what is super exciting to me about um, social movements is actually not necessarily marching, not necessarily protesting, but creating art and, or using culture to navigate and or to create some of the questions that you might have, right? So I love that it's like theater of black women, Right? Um, and that this was a flyer from that period, and this is some of the culture work that people were doing. I love that this picture is um, Gloria Becker, Dr. excuse me, Professor Gloria Becker, and next to her is a South African woman by the name of Tanya Leon, um, who passed in the 80s. She had cancer. But then, oh, I didn't mean to say but then. But then, <laughs> she, <laughs> I swear that I didn't set that up. But then she is Betty Carter. Does anyone know who Betty Carter is? Yeah, this is amazing because Betty Carter is a jazz vocalist from Detroit. And I'm like, what do you mean? And then I, Pata Pata, right, which is a South African, Mary yeah, Mary McKinney, right? Look at, all, look, look at all the places that come together on that, play, exactly, that come together on that flyer. South Africa, America, and the Netherlands. There has been a conversation happening between us for decades, you know what I'm saying? Around queerness, by the way, that these are all organizations, these are all folks, writers, thinkers, scholars, artists who are queer from different parts of the world. Gloria Becker, like I said, is from Suriname. Tanya Leon, as I said, is from um, South Africa. And then Betty Carter is from Detroit, right? Amsterdam has been in this conversation for a long time. We can move on. So what I wanted to talk about then is like, maybe I'm just sharing my personal journey of what it's meant for me. I want to go back to this question of why it matters. It's a matter, representation, visibility, and solidarity are matters of life and death. Do you, that sounds extreme, and I mean every word of it, right? Like this solidarity, representation, and visibility are matters of life and death which means you have to ask yourself the question, a, a global question, let alone a national one, of like, who in my country dies the most and why? Who in my country dies the most and why? Who in my country is less likely to receive the care, whether it's medical, whether it's social, that they need, right? So even this recent, I guess, scandal where the Dutch government, something around immigration and taxes and the way that, like, I, I'm not sure of the details, but I just know that that's an interesting place to think about because here you have a situation where the government had to be accountable for having these kind of discriminatory practices. 
in terms of the taxes and who they were paying close attention to and taxing for having more resources or money than they were supposed to have. That's my understanding of it from a distance. Um, and it's familiar. Uh, I've experienced something like that in America, right? Where like, um, I'm thinking of the 1980s, we have what you call a welfare queen, which is a term that Ronald Reagan introduced. This is Ronald Reagan who also ignored AIDS and said that it was essentially like a gay cancer and that the government didn't need to address it right away. So thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, white, black, brown, men, women, trans, right, cis, died while he was trying to figure out if their lives mattered. But he also was kind of um, doubling down on the notion that black women in particular were a threat to the country's resources because they were trying to apply for state support, right? This notion of state support. Even though I'm assuming that you and I know that the Dutch and America, or <laughs> the Americans who then freed themselves from the British, had primary roles in slave trading. Mm -hmm. we, we all know that, like that's not even a secret. Or in trading people in spices and, right? Like we all know that the money, the wealth that's on the table is wealth that was built from the labor of black and brown folks for centuries. We, we know that, right? So then to turn it around and say, hey, you're an immigrant and you're trying to get resources from this country and hey, you are black and you're trying to get money from the American government, what are you doing, shame on you, means that both the Dutch and the American government rely on you all not asking questions about black folks who you are neighbors with. They rely on it. They're like, well, I'm sure, you know, like they feel like they can get away with it. Like, because you've not had a massive national protest against the mistreatment of people of color, right? That those, those protests have been led by people of color, not necessarily by white folks, right? White folks have always been involved. We've always had folks that have been in solidarity, but on a national scale, you do imagine that if the majority of white people in in the Netherlands said enough is enough, you do know that there would be massive social change, right? It's a reliance on that silence. So what was important to me, the full circle is like, it is not that I have to remind myself that black queerness has existed for a long, long time, even thinking about it in the context of slavery, which someone reminded me to do, which I hadn't been doing. I'm sharing this as an important vulnerability. I'm telling you that my life and my history is connected to asking major questions about race and queerness, yet I didn't even think about what it meant to be gay and enslaved, right? I, I didn't even think about what, or I'll leave it there, I didn't even think about that, right? But what I do know is that there were people who were enslaved who were obviously gay. I mean, right? Have you all thought about that? Like, queer slaves, or sorry, queer folks who were enslaved? Have you thought about that before? Queer folks who were enslaved? It's almost as though we assume that they're all like people who were straight, who were enslaved. If, when you pause, when you think about it, you're not thinking like, oh, two men were in love on the plantation. Two women were in love on these Dutch boats and ships coming to the new world. People were in love, people were, right? Like, of course, but right, you see, but you see how we forget to think about the simple things, right? So I was just thinking about how long, and wanted to share with you all how long in a Black American context, um, queerness has been represented through popular culture. So what came up for me was the, you know, um, the blues women of the early 1900s. And of course we talk about be, you know, Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey, there are many movies about them, there are books about them, there's literature about them in the States that say that they were openly queer. And that's major, right? That they were openly queer, especially since, for example, <coughs> are you all familiar with what I mean by the blues as a music form? But how many of you think about the blues outside of these sort of singers as being just like a male-dominated 
form of music. You think of the guitar and the blues man, right? And kind of erase the, and then when you think of women, you're only thinking about them as singers, not as musicians, not as people with ideas, not as people with sexual preferences outside of the norm. You don't even think of the men like that. I just recently discovered that. I was like, I didn't even think about the possibility of gay-ass blues men. They exist, right? Right, but like how we get tricked into forgetting to think about ourselves, right? So I just wanted to bring Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith into the room, but also looking at this kind of history of gender bending, right? Um, here we have a photo from like the early 1900s. I'm not sure of the other two people on the left and right, but the last woman is a woman, a blues artist by the name of Alberta Hunter. And um, yeah, she went on to be in open relationships with, with women. All of them did. And this is common knowledge, right? We can go to the next one. But then I was thinking about the history of being seen in Gladys Bentley. Have you all, are you familiar with Gladys Bentley? You see how she's dressed in a three-piece suit with a cane and a top hat? You see how she has this pride and she has her stick and she is letting you know that she is present in her queerness, right? So she would perform, she was a blues singer, she was a pianist, right? And then she began to fold, she began to struggle with the criticism that she was receiving from the general public saying like, you're not right, it's not right that you're dressing like a man. It's not right that you are openly loving women. So literally like 15 years after she establishes herself as this major performance in drag, I say drag with quotes because people are challenging that word now, but drag, right, she takes out a full-blown spread in a newspaper and says, hey, 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 no, no, no worries about me anymore. I'm a woman again. I'm marrying a man. This is like early 1920s. Don't worry about me. I'm going to, I'm marrying a man. I am, I am woman again. She wrote that and published that and declared her heterosexuality. Says the, um, the, the sublime? Yes, please. Uh, let me read it. Amazing. Fabulous entertainer tells how she found happiness and love after medical treatment, <laughs> right? <No>. To correct, <laughs> to correct her strange affliction. Strange affliction. Medical treatment, right? But I'm just talking about the pressure of being seen. Because when we talk about who's brave enough to come out, or sometimes when we judge people who we say haven't come out, what is the cost of coming out? What is the cost of coming out? And so here's a, a representation of that. We can go to the next one. Another example is Rosetta, Sister Rosetta Thorpe. She's an amazing, she was an amazing blues guitarist who came out of the black church in America from the South. And she traveled in a duet with her partner for like 15 years. They traveled around the South, they traveled around America, and in fact, they made an international debut in London, and you know, people like Mick Jagger, and you know, Eric Clapp, the folk that were kids, watching her come to England and play her guitar, and then from there, being inspired, picking up guitars. There's a long history of how the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Who, right, were, paying attention to these blues women, right? So she goes on, you know, and she's like major, major success, but she's feeling the pressure of what it means to be seen. And so she has not just a wedding, she organizes a wedding in a massive stadium, right? And she called the press and she makes a public statement. I am no longer gay. I have been cured. I have been cured from my gayness, right? Because what does it mean, again, to be, you know, no, you know, one or two people who were out during this time and no one else is really wanting to be the face of gayness when you know the hostility that comes with that, right? We can go to the next one. You guys familiar with this person? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> what a queen of queens. <laughs> 
what an actual representation. If someone, if I, if, if someone said, hey, you can only choose one picture that represents gayness before you die, what would it be? <laughs> but it would be Little Richard. It would be a picture of Little Richard. But you would not believe that I just spent about two weeks reading his biography that came out in the 80s. And I cannot believe the struggle that he had for about 50 to 60 years. He was both, he continued to be openly gay, but also he decided to renounce his homosexuality and he said that it was a sin. So he became a minister and he walked away from rock and roll. Twice. I say twice because he came back, <laughs> right? He came back like, nah, I'm still gay, my bad, my bad, I'm still gay. I'm st I still love men. You know, J Jesus will be okay. But then he left again, right? And he went back to the church. And not only did he become a minister, he became a minister who actively sought out people who were gay and tried to convert them. Very, this is a very popular sort of like Christian conversion situation, medical treatment and or religious treatment, right? You guys with me? Yeah. Y'all, right, am I talking to you? Am I boring you? No. no. Y'all with me? Yeah. yeah. I don't want to talk your ears off and I no. just, you guys, we, we here? Yeah. yeah. Yay. All right. So, little Richard's super gay ass though. He is the rep, he is the ultimate icon and then he ends up setting what you call a sort of, he becomes the archetype. For Prince, for Michael, I would say, for Rick James, I would say, for Andre 3000, if you all are familiar with Outkast, right? He becomes someone, for Jimi Hendrix, right? He becomes Sly someone, Stone. and he is who? Sly Stone. Oh, Sly, absolutely yeah. Sly, right? He becomes someone who is able to hold that space, but he's, again, one of the only ones that's doing it publicly and having global attention. He too was in England and he was in Germany and he was in the Netherlands, right? But what is the cost of it? What is the cost of it, right? He felt like it was heavy on his soul. He felt like he had to remove himself from the disease that is queerness. And he was battling, he had this secret battle with, with, right, with churches, right? And so this is what he looks like in the 80s. Still showing you a little chest now, you know? <laughs> the, the shirt is still open, there's still... He was never able to not be himself, right? But look at how much work it takes to try to not be yourself. So you'll see him, I spent a lot of time with interviews with him in the 80s, and he's like, ooh, ooh, child, ooh, child. No, I'm no longer gay, uh-uh, no, ooh. And I'm like, Uncle Richard. Dude, <laughs> Uncle Richard, you, you are gay, it's not a, right? But again, the pressure to be seen. We can go to the next one. Mom's Maybelline. You all familiar with her? No. Oh, good, please go and watch anything, any of her comedy, you know, her, her comedy, her stand-up comedy, but more importantly, Whoopi Goldberg did an outstanding, an outstanding documentary on her life. And she's also from Harlem, 1920s, major drag and ballroom culture scene happening there, literally like 60 years before Pose, right? 60 years before, or no, not really, 100 years before Pose, I'm thinking about Pose now. 60 years before a film that is very famous for introducing folks to black and brown queerness in the New York 80s, which is a film called Paris is Burning. It's a standard text that you must see, right? Because it addresses this very thing, the cost of not being seen, the cost of being gay, who's dying the most, why, right? So the majority of the cast that was featured in that film died from AIDS, there was a trans woman who was murdered, right? Cancer, not having medical and health insurance, this is a very American thing, right? So Mom's Maybelline, 1920s, it is deep to me, major comedian, that her stage name was Mom's. And when she left that stage, she became Pops. And that's what her close friends called her, Pops. Right? Moms may bleed and, and pops. 
right? So this is just, a, this is, again, we're still in the 19, by this time, we're, we're, we've moved into the 1930s, 1940s, and the, are you all familiar with the Harlem Renaissance? Well, it's just a time, a period in New York where there were all these artists who moved from the South, they were dancers, they were singers, they were blues, they were jazz, but they were, right? And they had come to Harlem and were able to like perform on stage and, and to share their talents, right? So Moms Mabley was a part of that movement. We can go on. Now, I skipped the 50s, which is interesting. I'm so, it's so interesting that I skipped the 50s because I'm currently writing a book on a 1950s black queer musician by the name of Willie Mae Big Mama Thornton. Now, you might not be familiar with her, but you might be familiar with another fellow by the name of Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Anyone know Elvis Presley? Mm -hmm. Now, what we do, <laughs> is there anyone in the room who doesn't? Mm -hmm. Yet, is there anyone in the room who knows Willie Mae Thornton? Yes. You don't count. Hound dog. You don't count. Hound dog. Yeah. So the reason why I am writing about her, I was asked to write a book about Prince, and I was like, Prince has enough written about him. For the Prince, there's enough information about Prince. There's not enough information on Willie Mae Thornton. And when this when this book publishing company reached out to me, they said, Hey, would you be interested? And I was like. I actually want to write about this woman who I know nothing about so that I can dig deep into her life. And so it was the 1950s, which is why I've been reading about Little Richard and even Rosetta Thorpe, because these are the 40s, 50s era, right? I'm going to come to this disco queen in a second, but in the 1950s, this woman, Willie Mae Thornton, please promise me that you will go home and look her up and listen to her version of Hound Dog and then listen to Elvis's version of Hound Dog. And then understand that Elvis's rise to fame and him being called the king of rock and roll only erased the people he was studying. But erasure is maybe a common human challenge. The problem is that she died poor and that Elvis Presley, you all listen to me closely, this is very important, is still one of the richest entertainers in America. Still, yeah. do you, his estate, his home in Memphis is a museum, and he generates more than $50 million a year. She died poor in an unmarked grave. It was her song that he made popular. Invisibility, representation, solidarity, because I have now learned some things about Elvis that I am surprised to learn. Um, and so it's forcing me to change how I understand him, not just as someone who was just stealing black music and stealing black dance, but also someone who struggled and died from addiction and also was forced to work like a, you know, just exploited as well, as well, right? Like the part of his death includes how hard he was working, right? And him trying to take drugs to keep up, like Prince, like Whitney Houston, like Michael Jackson, to keep up with the pace of what it means to become an American star, right? So again, what is the cost of being seen even across race? But anyway, so that's Willie Mae Thornton. And so we are skipping the 60s and going into, but also Willie Mae Thornton and Little Richard and all of them continue to perform in the 60s. Right? Sylvester, how many of you are familiar with Sylvester? <laughs> okay. Friends, too. You can do that. <laughs> oh, it's so exciting that you're not familiar. I'm not judging you, right? I'm saying, please write these names down and go home and look at these folks. Look them up. I literally wanted to introduce you to them to give you all a start to ask some of these questions, to be in solidarity. Because Sylvester, who was born and raised in my hometown, which is Los Angeles, California, right, is, no, I'm sorry, there was a gang sign. It wasn't a real gang sign. It was just like, it means West Coast. It doesn't mean it's a gang sign. But who is from where <laughs> I'm from. And it's so exciting because he was like, you know, first of all, he identified as he and Disco Queen. He crowned himself the queen of disco, but also used he, him pronouns. 
this is interesting. And I'm going to come back to language and what it means for us to be unlearning these, these binaries, right? So Sylvester is this disco queen from the 70s, from LA. He then makes himself to the American gay capital of the world. Anyone know where that is? Did someone say nine years? <laughs> no, <laughs> no what you say? No, I said America's gay capital of the world. Yeah. San Francisco. It's San Francisco. Yeah. But what that means, I'm sorry I keep coming back to this dark place, but what that means is that people were dying at an alarming rate in this gay capital, including Sylvester, who died from AIDS. Right? Back to Reagan, back to the American response and the global government response to right, AIDS. But before that, he just was, I mean, the fierceness here. I mean, right, like, so I just, so I did grow up hearing my parents play Sylvester, which was weird because they were not gay pride advocates. They weren't super homophobic. I mean, they were homophobic, actually, now that I think about it, but I'm like, but they were playing Sylvester. They were playing Little Richard. They were playing Prince, and Prince didn't say, as a matter of fact, Prince challenges the notion that he is gay. But we all know that, that Prince represents queerness. Mm -hmm. Rather, it doesn't matter who he sleeps with. Mm -hmm. And also, not only that, that my mom's favorite artist was Prince, but I come to learn later on in life, Wendy and Lisa, you guys familiar with Wendy and Lisa from the group from Prince and Ray, so they were these white women, Italian, who were writing, co-writing, much of Prince's 80s music, and they were together as a couple for 10 years. And so, even when I was young, there was this one line, I think I said this last year, right, when I, like, you guys might remember, because it is on the Purple Rain soundtrack, and it's Wendy, yes, Lisa. Is the water warm enough? Yes, Lisa. Remember, I'm trying to tell you guys that that made me gay. I was like, I'm gay now. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, I'm, I'm just, I'm gay. It's like, because, yeah, I wanted my own Wendy. To, you know what I mean? Like, I wanted to be Lisa, or I wanted to be Lisa making the water for Wendy, right? Like, this was, again, I'm talking about Purple Rain 1984, which means I was nine. But Prince introduced me to a kind of spectrum of sexuality, right? And he even said it, am I black or white, am I straight or gay? Controversy. He played with us. Like, I'm not even going to tell you that I'm not going to tell you if I'm black. I'm not going to tell you if I'm white. I'm not going to tell you if I'm straight. I'm not going to tell you if I'm gay. But what I am going to do is wear high heels, eyeliner, a perm, a coat with just briefs. And so you decide on your own. But if you're only limited to what is masculine and feminine, then you might just lose out on all that I'm offering. Right? So Sylvester and, and Prince comes after Sylvester, right? But in that family of gender bending, much like Michael Jackson, in that family of gender bending, I'm conscious, as a matter of fact, I'll stop there with Michael Jackson, but we can go on to the next one. And so I wanted to really, really acknowledge things like voguing um, and the history of it and the fact that this is someone who's considered to be one of the thought leaders and founding, founding dancers. Oh, hello, we have a dancer in the room, right? Mm. Willie Ninja, who was also one of the featured artists in Paris is Burning. It's so important to think about Willie Ninja. You know why? Because I met voguing through Madonna. Mm. And I was like, oh, Madonna, she's voguing. Listen, Madonna, she's voguing. Had no idea that this was a black art form being cultivated in New York, the same New York where Black Bentley was from, the same New York that Little Richard performed in, the same New York that Prince went and signed a record deal, right? That in New York, these black and brown queer folks who were struggling with poverty, who were dealing with AIDS, who were, do were creating this form of music that Madonna introduces to the world. And that we, con you know, unconsciously are like, oh yeah, v Vogue, Madonna. What? Who gets erased? And I'm a big fan of dance. I'm a major fan of black dance in particular because it saved lives. People 
left their homes or got kicked out of their homes, and then they went into ballroom communities and they found fathers and mothers. Willie Ninja was the father of the House of Ninja. So people who were homeless, teenagers who were homeless during the AIDS era, right, had a place to go. And go and do what? Go and dance, go and be safe, go and be seen, right? Um, and so that's what Paris is Burning is about, so please go and see that. But unfortunately, Willie Ninja dies. Willie Ninja dies, when did, can, hold on, I, would, I, I wish I would have um, remembered, because I love Madonna, by the way, right? And I, and I really love that album. It's another album that contributed to my queer identity, Like a Prayer, right? That, I mean, quite honestly, Madonna, the reason why Madonna knew about voguing is because she was in the black and brown disco clubs in the late 70s and the early 80s, right? This is not, Madonna is very much so a part of the black disco movement, and she had been. And she's Italian, right? And she's dark skin, dark hair, an interesting kind of Italian that we know is also discriminated against within the context of Europe in terms of Italy's proximity to North Africa and the routes that the Moors took, right, to go into those countries, like Turkey, like the south of France, right, Greece, right, where there are darker skin, olive skin, white people. Yeah, y'all with me? Does that make sense? Did y are y'all witnesses of that? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right, so the Italians in New York were absolutely discriminated against by the Polish and by the white folks who were like, these, they would call them grease balls because of their hair. Right? Um, and because of their olive skin, right? So Madonna has her own history that would help me understand why she was attracted to black and brown queerness. I was like, okay, I, I, that makes sense, right? I was curious, so I asked questions. But it's just important to think about the fact that he also died, right, from AIDS. 2nd of December, 2nd of September, 2006. What? He died. Of what year? 2006. Okay, so that's interesting. Okay, and can you just tell me when Like a Prayer came out? 1989. Right, so that, right, so that space between 89 and 2006, I'm telling you, I had no idea Willie Ninja existed. I had no idea until I, you know, like when he died, I understood the importance, like, even, you know, just like, oh, you, these are just, this is the time where I came into Paris is burning and you learn that these things exist and you, been, you begin to ask questions and you follow a rabbit hole and you're like, what? Right, so are you guys familiar with the television show Pose? Mm -hmm. So they explore this very question of who's, of, of cultural appropriation. This is another word that we're hearing. This is another phrase that we are in, all in conflict about, right? Um, because it's not as simple as, hey, you can't admire the culture. What? Of course you can. Like, I mean, blues and jazz and all of those things are made up of European compositions and instruments that we were introduced to. Of course we are going to be integrating our cultures, of course. But who's benefiting more? Who remains poor? Who continues to die more often than not? Right? Those are where the questions are, not in the admiration or the respect or the attraction to the culture, but to what the inequality means on a day-to-day -day basis for those people who are being appropriated, imitated, respected, respected, right? So you guys with me? So the fact that you, it's important then for you all to know that that is, um, to use his language, and also he identified as he, as this is the founding father and thought leader of Vogue, who passed from AIDS. And he was, and he was a student of freaking ninjas. This is the thing: is that he was curious. Talk about appropriation. Well, his whole style was based on right ninja self-defense techniques. That's important to consider, right? Like we're not saying don't, right? That's really interesting. And he's like, wait a minute, that's a culture that I'm interested in adding my voice to or interpreting through my body's voice. My body's, okay, for the dancers, my body's voice, Fernando. 
my body voice, right? So we can go on. Um, and then I just really want to talk about these moments in my life again. Um, the Color Purple by Alice Walker. Because I remember that my mom had the book. And I remember telling her that I was bored one day. Which you should never say to a parent because you know what they're going to do. Oh, you're bored? Oh, bored? Oh, you can, oh, because you can clean up. There's a book you can get in, right? And I was like, I'm bored, mama. And she was like, well, read this. And I will never forget. She was like, you know what? Never mind. You're too young. <laughs> That's what she said. She took the damn book back. I was like, mama, you took the book. She took the book back. She said, never mind. You're too young. The moment I was able to read in a real way without her guidance, I picked up that book. And I found Seeley and Suge Avery. And finding Seeley and finding Suge, which are two characters in the film who fall in love, both of them coming from these really interesting, extreme, sort of separate worlds. Seeley is this super abused person who is essentially sold off into the marriage with someone who is violent. That person happens to be in love with Suge Avery who was a blues woman who got essentially kicked out of the black church because she was too loose as a blues woman. She was too loose, right? So throughout the film, there are references to her father as a minister kind of denouncing her presence. Like, no, you can't come back to the church. You have children without fathers. You drink and you like women. You're not welcome here anymore. So those two fall in love. And that is one of the first times that I saw black women kissing on a big screen. And I felt so embarrassed. I watched it, I watched it with my parents and I felt so embarrassed. I was like, oh God, please don't look at me looking at it. Cause I can't stop looking. I can't stop looking at what it feels like to see someone on television kissing another woman who looks like me. Like, please don't, like, please don't stop me from looking. Cause I don't know if you all have this thing with your parents, sometimes they'd be like, don't look. Yeah. I was like, please don't do that to me right now. I've got to see Celia and Shook kiss. <laughs> like, please let me see them kiss. And I saw them kiss, Celia and Shook, right? So go and watch The Color Purple to, you know, to, to learn about um, Alice Walker's intervention and the way that, as you all now know, based on this talk, she was using the history of, of blues queer women to create this fictional character. Right? Like, that's the thing about Alice Walker is that she, she's from the South and she's from the church and she was like, she created this whole character. We can go on. So I go there because we started this talk with these two. And I know you all couldn't hear everything and that the sound was a little bit, especially, you know, like, the, it was a little bit um, challenging. But The Women of Brewster Place was a book, which Alice Walker, The Color Purple is a book, became a film. The Women of Rooster Place was a book um, that was written in the 80s by Gloria Naylor. And um, these are some of the women who are involved with the, you know, the story. It's interesting, I don't know if you all are familiar with the woman Cicely Tyson who just recently died, maybe, no, Cicely Tyson? Look her up if not. But this was the second time because this came after The Color Purple. Do you know that, that build up where she's like, they, and did you get my cookies? And I was a young girl, was like maybe by this time, like uh, 11. So again, Wendy and Lisa had already made me gay, right? Um, the color purple made me gay. But then I watched, then I was like, oh my God, they have an apartment together? Wait, she's a te they both are professionals? Oh, she knows that she wants cookies? Oh, they, you know, like, I, I, they have this intimacy. What, and then the, the clues as you listen, oh, they, live, they lived in different places together? So they are living a life together? Because the only people who I see living a life together are, like, men and women on television. You're telling me that they were living a life together? That this argument is based on the history of them running away from homophobic communities? Did you all get that from the film? Did you understand what was yeah. going on there? But the, I'm not sure about the sound. But I, I was telling Andrea that like, when my, I remember just like my mom walking in the room just being like, oh, not looking, not looking, once again, right? I don't want you to see, and in fact, please just move through this room, don't stop, don't listen, because I know you're gonna be upset with me. Go 
family and affirmed in watching this thing be normalized, right? This thing be normalized. So the Women of Ruther Place was another place for me where I was like, um, I do exist. I do exist. But I, but I, and so I do exist. But also, to come back to this other question of why it matters, is, is so what, I'm one person that Prince made gay. So what, I'm one person that Suge and Silly made you know, gay. But I'm also one person who's still alive, and I'm thinking about the number of people who took their lives, mm-hmm. right? When I, so this talk is about that kind of vulnerability. Um, thinking about the people who took their lives because they didn't see affirming images of themselves, right? But also thinking about the people whose lives were taken because those people who took their lives didn't see them as human, didn't see representations of them. Do you see the extreme? It's actually a very important thing to consider. And when I say that visibility representation, our life and death matters, that's what I mean, because we know that teenage queer suicide rate has been, for decades, exceptionally high. Young people who are queer have been killing themselves, but I will say that we're in an interesting and new place, not to say that there's, you know, less struggle and trauma and sadly suicide around it, But I do think that there's an interesting kind of generational push for us to be better. Don't you guys notice? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? The young people are forcing us to have different language. Mm -hmm. Do you know even us older queer folks are realizing how ignorant we are and how we have been thinking in terms of binary, of butch and femme, of man and woman. We haven't been thinking in terms of pronouns. We haven't been thinking in terms of, right, outside of what we know. I don't think I have been. I was not saying they to describe the person until I saw young people saying, actually, we're not masculine or feminine. We're not men or women. We are the folk between. And we choose to be on that spectrum, right? So um, this is one of those, these are are images that I've shown you that allowed me to feel in my body and to not turn to alcohol or drugs and you know like um when a lot of us did and have and will right we can go on so the things that really begin to because i want to get into this question of trans identity it's really really a deep subject right now you all are you all paying attention to the amazing but also controversial and challenging discussions around transness and the spaces within LGB, not necessarily T, communities, and of course that that acronym is growing, right? We know that to include so many other letters, asexual, intersexual, transsexual, right? Like that that four letter that we used to use comfortably in the 80s, 90s, and probably 60s, 70s through now, the, the acronyms are growing And we have to ask ourselves if we could have a decent conversation about every letter in that acronym. We we have a responsibility to now ask ourselves what it means to be asexual. What it means to be, as my niece is, pansexual, right? What it what it means to be transsexual and 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 not queer. Right, like that there are all these layers that are being introduced to us at an abnormal pace. At an abnormal pace. It's important that we say that. So I started to, uh, I was a producer actually of this documentary that was called Treasure from Tragedy to Trans Justice. And it was about the story of, oof, oof. It's a horrific story about a, a trans woman and a, a woman who was, um, who was murdered. And basically she was murdered by these drug dealers in Detroit who, um, she was murdered because she, it was assumed that she cooperated with the, the cops, right? To, to um, snitch, as we call it in America, to tell the authorities on these men who were having sex with her, right? And the fact that they had this whole drug set up, right? 
So what happened was the cops revealed her identity. And so they, mm, this is a trigger warning, it's violent, you know, just to let you all know, because one of, for me, it was a, a difficult thing to, to be part of because um, they found different parts of her body spread through the city, right? And the cops intentionally revealed her identity, right? Um, and so we went to her mother's house and spoke to her mother, that's her mother. Um, and we, we went to different places in Detroit. But that was my real, if I'm honest, this was in 2013, that was my real first encounter with what it could mean to be trans, black and trans and woman. That was my first encounter. I, I have to be honest and say that before then, I was kind of like, yeah, we're gay, they're, they're trans, they're over there. We're all gay, but they're over there. I don't have trans friends, I don't have trans folks in my community, they're over there. Yes, we're part of this, yes, they're the T in LGBT, but they're over, that T is a lonely T. We know that that T is a lonely, right? That T does not get the attention, the resources, the investment that the LGB does, and maybe even B is somewhere over there. But certainly lesbian and gay folks have the, right, much more of a presence, much more of a, almost like we have been, we've arrived at a place where we are now part of a normal society. Trans folks haven't arrived at that place, not even within our communities, right? So, and this actual talk is an intervention, right, because, um, we want to have the real uncomfortable conversation. So I was one of the producers on this film learning about this history. But what I really appreciated about working with the director is this small subtitle that makes a world of difference, which is from tragedy to trans justice. You know why? Because I realized pretty much every time I hear about trans people, it's because they've been murdered. I don't hear about what they create, I don't hear about them as writers, I don't hear about them as dancers, I don't hear about, I hear about them dying, right? And so to say from, trans, from tragedy to trans justice and to make an intentional decision to highlight some of those vulnerabilities um, that I've learned about in Paris is Burning, like the question and that we're learning about in polls, like the question of realness. Right? So when Pose, the television show, opens, one of the things that Billy Porter says is that the category is realness. It's, it's film realness, it's boy realness, whatever it is, right? But the object of the game is to appear to be as real, as close as possible to a cis woman or a cis man. That's the object of the context is to try to appear to be closest to what is real, right? Now think about that in the context of trans folks and sex work, say for example. Think about the danger and what happens to them when it, it is discovered by cis men that they are not quote unquote real. That oftentimes results in violence, right? Like how dare you, I mean, you, you, like, and sometimes People know that they're not real. I mean, real in terms of the context of what we've been taught is realness, or that they're not cis folks, not real, but cis folks, and actually lure them into dangerous situations because they are not cis, right? Cis, what, like, female and or male, right? So that is the case with something that happened with one of the cast members of Paris is Burning, where to this day, her murder hasn't been solved, but, the last time she was thought to be alive was with someone in a hotel. And so um, what does it mean for us to be thinking about trans folks not just in the context of being murdered, but in the context of cultural workers and creators and politicians and thinkers and teachers, and, right? Like how can we as folks who might not identify as trans um, not just make space because we own the space, but acknowledge our arrogance Right, and not having questions about what their experiences are. You follow me? So we can go on. And so I wanted to bring Marsha P. Johnson into the conversation um, because 
One of the things that I saw with the Black Pride Netherlands group here was that they referenced um, Marsha P. Johnson, right? Which I thought was interesting um, because, like I said, you know, the Black Americans are, are present. No matter what, you know, like that, that somehow sometimes becomes the, the kind of, the, the place of um, where other movements begin to have different conversations in their own countries. Mm -hmm. um, which I think mm -hmm. is both exciting but also challenging and problematic, right? Because what it means is that um, you, you won't hear, you know, Black Lives Matter activists necessarily talking about what is happening to Black Dutch folks. You, you just, that's, because we don't have access to the same, the pipeline, America sells Black culture, right? So like as a, as a whole separate thing. The Dutch doesn't sell black culture to the world, right? Spain doesn't sell black culture. London, England, UK, maybe a little more, yes. Um, Greece, but the folks are not selling black culture the way that America does and have been for, for I would say, centuries. But so um, the fact that this black pride that folks are trying to do here was inspired by the 1960s. I believe Stonewall riots in New York in the West Village is interesting to me, right? Um, and and then I will use this to talk about two things. Yes, Marsha P. Oh no, oh, sir. Mar oh no, Marsha P. Johnson was not was was not um, or is not alive. I should say Marsha P. Johnson is is not alive, right? Um, Marsha P. Johnson was was murdered as well, and that murder is still unsolved. Okay, but Marsha P. Johnson has been sort of erased from the Stonewall narrative. So what, I, what, what, what we're talking about here is that somehow even gayness, when we close our eyes, equates to white cis maleness globally. And even if we're including people of color, Gayness then equate to black cis gay maleness, right? So who gets erased in that are the folks who identify as women on a spectrum, which is something I'm learning about. Like, are you all familiar with the tension and the real concern around, what's her name? Oh my God, I love her book. Well, first Chimamanda, um, the Gigi. Yeah, not her, but I'm talking about J.K. Rollins, right? Yeah. Both of them are in the same category as having these controversial positions on what a trans woman is and whether or not a trans woman is a real woman, no, right? Just write the book now of Ngozi's work and then before the story. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, right? So these are real questions that are happening in queer circles right now, of like pr the privilege of cis women, the privilege of cis men. But also, as I said, just the complicated nature of erasure. That's really what, right? Because Marsha P. Johnson um, identified as she and her, often referred to herself as the queen, right? Was killed for not, you know, for whatever reasons that are related to her sexuality. But I, and this, this corner, this, this picture on the left, come out of your ivory tire, towers and into the street, like come out of the academy, come out of these queer organizations. Right? I'm thinking of queer organizations in New York during this time, like ACT UP, right? Um, and ACT UP was one of those organizations that were criticized for representing the needs and concerns, the needs and health concerns of white gay men during the AIDS crisis, right? So that Stonewall riot is interesting because it sets off a kind of social movement from black folks like Audrey Lord, who was here in the Netherlands, right? Um, in the 1980s with Gloria Becker organizing around, you know, flamboyant and different black gay institutions here. And, and just kind of trying to think through what it means to not have representation by major organizations that get the government money. Because once it was realized that Reagan was wrong, do you know how much money flowed into white gay male-led organizations? And how many resources white cis gay men with AIDS then had? 
and what that meant about who was dying the most and who didn't have those resources. And yet, both white gay cis and black gay cis men come together in the club and dance. Is that solidarity, right? That, that becomes an interesting question, right? Um, and so, and then also where are women in these stories and where are trans women in these stories? So um, that's just a kind of check-in. We can go to the next one. I'm wrapping up soon. So I was also thinking about, you know, um, just this new, new for my generation, um, representation of trans, of trans folks in particular. More so trans women, and I have someone recently ask me a critical question that I had to sit with, right? Which is that, do I still notice that the people who are represented are traditionally pretty? That's deep. <laughs> like, damn, I can't, every time I ask a new question, a new one comes up. I thought I had arrived. I was like, oh, good, representation, good. But pretty privilege is a thing. People still don't want to quite be disturbed. They want something, check this out, that is, that is as real, real as possible to what a heterosexual society has deemed as feminine. So we're still in this game, you know, like we're still having representation, but I know a lot of trans women who proudly wear beards. What about that, right? Like, just that look a different way, that are really complicating gender. Not just like a comfortable, like, oh, you look like a real pretty woman, so you do get television access, and with that million dollar contract, right? All of that stuff. But still, at the same time, it does do something for young people who get to see themselves, who now identify as trans, or folks who have questions and are learning about some of the issues that come up in shows like Trans, I mean, like Pose, where both of them are actresses. So there's Dominique Jackson, who, by the way, is now working with Solange, Beyonce's sister. And I did a talk last year, I'm not gonna get into this thing, but I just say that like Beyonce and Solange are actively trying to become allies. And they consistently hire queer folks to help build their image and their dances, right? Choreographers, makeup artists, right? That, that are queer and trans. They've been doing that for a long time because that's where a lot of the talent is. To make, to construct. Do you know how many trans um, women are involved with the public construction of femininity? Think about that, right? The Beyonce is the ultimate woman. Oh my gosh, she's the ultimate woman. And behind her is a team of gay folks that help her achieve that status, right? So Dominique Jackson is from Pose, and she's from Trinidad. And so the reason why I pulled this up too is just the diasporic aspect, right? Um, India Moore, who I just learned today, is just 27 years old, so I feel bad about my crush on her. But it's just like, right, like, so like Haitian and Puerto Rican and Dominican in the award, right? Now, are you all familiar with this person with the orange background? No. Are you familiar with the woman who the person is hugging? <gasps> Sade? Yes, it's Sade. Sade. It's Sade. Wow. wow. Are we familiar with Sade? Yes. 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 Yeah. I didn't recognize her. Well, I want you to meet her son, Isaac. Theo Adu, who was born Malika Adu, right? And Isaac um, publicly thanked his mother for the support that she has given him to transition. Wow. That's major. That gave me good goosebumps, mm -hmm. right? Um, because that's major. Your mom is this kid. Like, she could have easily been. I, can, I mean, I don't know what kind of private conversations they've had, but what I know is that the grace that she has maintained, the way that she doesn't misgender her son, even that, it might seem minor to not misgender, but it's a major thing because there are parents who are like, well, my daughter wants to be a man. No, mom, I identify as he, him. I'm not a daughter, I'm your son. Right, this whole process. The fact that Sade, who happens to be in 
my top three favorite singers in the world is interesting, but then also that these are Nigerians. She's Nigerian and British. Her father was Nigerian, her mother was British. Right, just, just, just the global aspect of it, right? Um, so that made me happy. I don't think there's any, let's see if we can go to the last one, or, okay, so here's what I wanna end on. Um, here's what I want you all to, let's see, consider as I wrap this up, which is, this real, back to this discomfort, right? Um, and I just said something like, misgendering is a form of violence. Raise your hand if you all have misgendered people. Yeah. Misgendered someone. And what I mean by misgendered, good, thank you for asking that. So I made an assumption. To misgender is to simply, not, to misgender someone is to incorrectly make an assumption about what gender they are wearing based on superficial kind of pre right, 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 we've all done it and guess what, we're going to do it and we're gonna to continue to do it, right? But we now need to be conscious of the fact that it does feel like a form of violence and maybe even laziness, right? Um, I have had to check myself, so my new thing that I can pass on to you all is to just say they with anyone you describe which is hard because it's not grammatically correct. I know that people make that argument. I even do it with my parents and they were like, they who? I thought you were talking about one person. And I'm like, no, they, right? Like they as in they are not male or female. They is a pronoun that represents the fact that they are gender non-conforming, which is another phrase that trans folks, gender non-conforming folks, queer folks are using to detach themselves away from masculine, feminine, man, woman. Who are the people in between? Who are the people in between? And what do we have to do to learn a new language, which we do? Not only do we have to learn a new language around gender and sexuality, ask queer people if all of you are queer, if you're not, just as human beings, we actually have to unlearn a language and leave that over here and learn a new language. Two things at once which means we're going to fail. We're going to fail. But it is important that you feel uncomfortable, right, failing, so that you can feel good about trying, right? Like, you, you have to feel uncomfortable to the point where you're like, oh, I'm not just gonna misgender you for the next five years, right? Which happens to people. Like, okay, you, people, parents in particular, like, I'm not going to call you my son when I had a daughter. Right, what does it mean to constantly misgender? Well, like misgendering could be dangerous to people if you let on to the fact that they are a different identity, that they are not real, right? That could place them in danger. It's really our job to learn this new language, um, but also to give ourselves a kind of grace, right? To give ourselves a kind of grace around the learning process. But I want to end by saying you, you will not, you don't deserve grace. None of us in the room deserve grace if you're not asking questions about who is represented and who is not and how you're learning and how you're engaging, what space you're taking up, what privileges you have, what you mean by solidarity, loving black music isn't enough, right? Like what, is, what does it mean to um, really ask new questions as queer folks, that's what I feel like I'm in the process of doing. I've gotten it wrong, I've had people be mad at me, there are people who won't speak to me again, because I continue to, about five years ago, be like, oh, she, 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 I'm like, oh, God, I'm sorry, I'm so, right? So it took me years to say they, or to say him to someone who I knew to be she for all my life, right? That's not that, so give ourselves grace, but also do the work because solidarity is uncomfortable. Representation, visibility, right, are things that help us reach real solidarity. So thank you all so much. Oh, this is the last thing, because these are just three books that you all might be interested in exploring on trans identity. Um, one is in the context of like Black American, and then there's this Trans Britain, Our Journey from the Shadows, um, about the UK experience, and then Trapdoors is kind of like diasporic engagement of trans identity. I think that you should try to, you know, we should be trying to educate ourselves, you know, as a part of this solidarity work. So I just wanted to leave you all with some resources. So thank you so much. Thank you.